Great. Thank you guys all so much for being here. I really appreciate the time that you're taking to call in. It's always a pleasure to see you guys. Some of you haven't seen me now for a year or two, so it's good to see you again. Uh, this is a compilation of work from my PhD, and I've done a little bit more since then, since I finished about a year ago now. So I just added some of that on um, towards the end of it. Just some thoughts that I have about the future of some of this type of research in the Flinders Ranges. Okay, so just to give you guys a little bit um, about my background, who am I? So sorry, Michelle, I, the, um, the screen, sorry, Michelle, the screen share seems to have stopped. Okay. Um, you wanna try that again? Sure. Mine hasn't, Ellen. Oh, sorry, carry on. <laughs> Is it good? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. All right. So um, just to give you guys a little bit about my background um, and where I come from. So I grew up in the northern U.S. right near the Canada border. And um, I went to an undergraduate university, the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, where I did a bachelor's uh, research as well in geology. Uh, from there, I moved to New Mexico State University in 2008, where I completed my master's degree. And that's when I began working in the Flinders Ranges. So the first time I came to the Flinders was in 2009. Uh, once I completed my master's degree, I went on to uh, move to Houston, where I worked for uh, Royal Dutch Shell, Houston. So I was a seismic interpreter in the Gulf of Mexico where I actively participated in lease sales, looked for prospects, um, made sites ready to drill, things like that. Um, at the end of 2015, I took an academic leave of absence to go pursue my PhD uh, with the same research group that had moved to UTEP, University of Texas, El Paso. So I continued working on similar areas, same sort of things, but just kind of took things a step further. Uh, while I was uh, doing my PhD, I did some consulting work for BP Americas in Houston. And since then, um, I've decided to, well, I was supposed to come in April, but unfortunately didn't make it before COVID hit. So not right now I'm just serving as an honorary visiting uh, fellow with um, the Australian School of Petroleum and Energy Resources. And also just doing a lot of volunteer work for the APG and things like that, which has been really fun. So on to an introduction of my research. So today I'll be going over uh, just some classification systems. Uh, this is something that I've developed quite a bit further, but I'm actually not going to present it until a special SALT conference in April. So I'm not necessarily showing you the latest and greatest, unfortunately, but um, there's more things in the first part of the talk that I've developed. Um, I'll go on to the significance and then uh, we'll go through the geologic setting, which most of you are probably pretty familiar with. And then I'll hone in on uh, what I specifically did for this study, a very um, sort of preliminary geochemical study. And then I'll be going with you uh, through with you the geologic model and conclusions. So to start off with the introduction. So here we have salt tectonics terminology. Um, I'm sure some of you are really familiar with this. Others of you may not be familiar at all. So I'll be communicating with you in a way that hopefully reaches everybody. Some, term, some terminology and some things that I'll be using uh, throughout this talk are uh, first thing is pre-salt. So this is things or class, if you will. So if you're thinking of the lithology or the rock type of the rift, that is um, what I'll refer to as pre-salt. So sometimes those blocks and pieces of rock that are in your rift can be incorporated into the salt. If you see any sort of pieces of um, Laird evaporite sequence or the salt sequence, we refer to that in our classification system as synsalt. And then um, very young stratigraphy, so basically the basin fill that would have been deposited um, just after a salt horizon, would be referred to as post salt. Additionally, if I speak to uh, the mother salt, if you will, or sort of the original Laird evaporite sequence, which may contain a lot of salt, it may not really contain hardly any salt at all. 
um, that is referred to in the salt tectonic literature as being autochthonous. Once salt starts to move vertically and move into a diapir form and then flow laterally, like in the middle of the screen, we refer to any salt sheets, so salt that's flowing laterally as alochthonous. And then once you're dealing with a lochness, you have things that are deposited above an alochthonous salt sheet that I'll refer to as super salt, and things that are below that salt, which I'll refer to as subsalt. And then just a very generic term, any sort of thing that you see in a potential diapiric body is just referred to as intrasalt. So hopefully um, I don't lose you with all the salty terminology, which I know it's easy to do. So the next thing I'll be talking about in, is inclusion types. And this is basically um, the bits and pieces that we see in salt bodies that would not have originally been halite. So originally you can have things, as I said, from the pre-salt and that's what is uh, labeled here in the, um, in the gray. Typically pre-salt is really hard to see on seismic data. It's usually in smaller uh, blocks maybe the size of a house. So it's really uh, something that we see more sub-seismic. I'm not aware, um, I've been compiling a database and I'm not really aware of anything that's like monstrous in seismic scale. Um, the other type of inclusions are sin salt inclusions. So if you've ever been up to Wichelina diapir, um, you can see the shape of the diapir in the central part of this image, but then more towards the bottom of the diaper, you see um, these isoclinal and recumbent folds. Those are uh, referred to as inclusions. So those are sin salt inclusions. Those beds, I've actually mapped those. Those are um, mostly carbonate beds. And then also, if anyone has interpreted seismic in the North Sea, a really prolific hydrocarbon province, um, there's also sin salt things, pieces, if you will, that are referred to as stringers. Um, so you can see the Zextine salt body in the middle of the image in the North Sea, and you can see these little um, amplitudes or seismic anomalies that are in the salt. Those are the stringers, and those are also carbonate beds, um, sometimes carbonate and anhydrite, and that's why they really light up. So that's another place where we see something identical. You can see that the type of the structural geology is very different. So you have boudinage in the Zextine while you have the recumbent folds in the Warrens. So that's like a whole nother really interesting thing about this is the deformation that can take place in salt bodies. And then the last type are post salt. So this is something that um, I actually focus on in this work is uh, describing any post salt inclusions. What's really cool about this is it can include uh, volcanics. So a lot of times um, you'll actually see younger intrusions that'll cross cut salt. And here, I believe this is also in the North Sea, the volcanics preferentially choose uh, the carnelite beds within the salt sequence. The graphic up on the upper left is from the Gulf of Mexico. Another type of inclusion that you see is referred to as suture zones or carapace. So these would have been um, little roofs on top of diapirs that um, get incorporated in the salt. So you have a coalescing of multiple salt bodies. And when you have multiple salt bodies come together, you can incorporate sediments within the salt. And this is something that's very common in the Gulf of Mexico, where I had done a lot of my work at Shell and BP. So the significance of the research. So this um, is really important for mostly uh, like for a petroleum implication, it would be drilling hazards. So in the Gulf of Mexico, um, when I was working in from 2010 ish to 2015, the rigs cost about a million dollars a day. And if you were to hit one of these things in while you were drilling, it would uh, often cost upwards, you could end up the rig being down for 10 days and lose $10 million. So at that time, this research was really important uh, for that fact, for a money standpoint. Additionally, what's really neat about carbonate specifically uh, with mining implications. So this is something that um, I've been working on and thinking about a little bit more lately, seeing as we're having this big shift in energy right now is um, a lot of times you see copper and other sorts of precious metals that are associated with the carbonates that have been encased in salt. 
Um, one example would be the Padawarta Dye Pier that I worked at. And then also just to the south is Blinman Dye Pier. So if you ever have a chance to get up to the Flinders and do the Blinman uh, Copper Mine Tour, it's really great from a historical perspective. And then also you can walk into the salt body and actually see everything. There can also be other types of energy implications such as geothermal. Um, that's a little bit more esoteric and also things like uh, CCS, so carbon capture and also hydrogen storage. Also people will uh, put nuclear waste in salt mines. This is really common practice in Europe. So there's all sorts of different reasons of why you would wanna know something about salt. These are some of the additional hazards. So besides being drilling hazards, uh, you can get isolated pockets of bitumen. Um, you can get gas pockets. You can get internal shear zones. So there will be sp very specific places in which salt will creep and move along. Um, you can also get mobile evaporites. So not all evaporites are created equal. Some of the rheology is flows really easily, especially under pressure. Other types of evaporites act more rigid or more like a shale, for example. So there's a lot of things going on, going on in salt and a lot of reasons why you would wanna know what's inside of a salt dye up here. Additionally, um, this is just an image from Schlumberger, a drilling hazard. So this is taken from the Gulf of Mexico. And um, it's a concern because when you put your drill pipe down and the, starts, the salt starts flowing, it can actually cause that drill pipe to move. And a lot of times um, companies may abandon wells that maybe aren't economic or they need to wait to get new data, like new seismic data or something, and they'll leave the well. And then they'll try to re-enter the well bore and then it's moved. And it's like, well, why has that happened? So these are all reasons why this happens and why this research is important and how you ultimately sell it to um, corporations to get your funding. Okay. so. Going into a geologic setting. So I'm sure most of you are really familiar with the Flinders Ranges. It's near and dear to my heart and like my favorite place in the whole world. Um, so this is just a brief summary. So I'm sure you guys, um, you know this really well, but there's a ton of sediments, Precambrian, uh, early Cambrian sediments that were deposited in a Precambrian rift that was uh, thought to be associated with the breakup of Rodinia. What's really cool is um, the Cambro, maybe even the Neoproterozoic slightly earlier, there was a regional shortening event referred to as the Dalmerian orogeny. And because of that orogeny is why we can see these fantastic outcrops today. So if that would have never happened, everything would still be in the ground. So it's really great that um, the uplift and the subsequent erosion since then that has taken place that has really allowed us to do these incredible outcrop studies. And then just another thing to note is that the original halite or what we're calling halite, even though there may have been very little halite, um, has replaced, been replaced by a modern and uh, ancient cap rock. So we refer to this as um, a dolomicrite in the literature. And um, it's also referred to as a diapyric matrix. So you may hear me saying that. Um, there's, I have a lot of theories. I do not think all the diapyric matrix is equal in the Flinders. And um, I hope that some of this work today maybe shed some light on that. All right, so what I'll be working on today is um, Padawar to diapyric. So that's in the central Flinders ranges. If you've seen my work before, um, you would have known and that I work there and have seen uh, some of this. So this is sort of a compilation of, you know, the last 12 years of working there. So the, um, the Klana group or the autochthonous, the mother salt, the original Laird evaporite sequence that may have actually contained very little salt um, was deposited down, uh, probably its oldest would have been a billion years. Wolfgang can probably speak better to this than I and Jared as well. Um, the sediments that I'll be looking at is from the Ediacaran time period. So that's in uh, the Wolpina group. And specifically, I've focused on the uppermost Bunyaroo formation through the bottom of the Bonnie sandstone. So I don't actually get to the Ediacaran member in the Bonnie sandstone, but I'm in the lowermost part. 
When you look at the literature and the Laird evaporite sequence, you will find something uh, very curious. And I know that um, this is actually taken from and adapted from Wolfgang's research, um, his 1987 volume. But if you look at his stratigraphic columns in there, you'll actually see uh, that the Gammon ranges, which are uh, near Arcarula, so off to the northeast, they contain um, really old part of the sequence. So they have the Arcarula subgroup, and these are uh, mostly siliciclastics and volcanics. And then there's a really large unconformity. You don't actually see the Curdy Merca subgroup outcropping there. But if you go over to uh, the Willern ranges, you see um, the Curdy Merca. So this is really beautiful. Um, Siliciclastics, there's um, a volcanic tuff and also carbonates, mostly limestones. Um, so you'll see those in the Willern ranges. And then the dye piers that are in the Willern ranges, you'll actually see, if you will, inclusions or class. So things that have been incorporated and encased in salt from the Arcarula subgroup. So you'll go around, and this is on Kalana Station, you'll actually see inclusions of the Black Knob marble and different types of really old volcanics from the Arcarula subgroup. So it seems that there's actually sort of two different and very distinct, um, at least two salt sequences. And then what's really interesting is it's hard to correlate the beds, uh, the Curdy Merca subgroup from the Willern ranges to the Flinders ranges. So there's actually no physical location that I'm aware of that you can go and say, okay, I can correlate those rocks in the Willern ranges into the Flinders ranges. And this is that exact correlation. So I think what Wolfgang's done here is excellent. It's a really good first pass, but it's not something you can physically walk and see how those beds correlate. And what I'm proposing here today is that actually perhaps some of the stratigraphy that's in um, the Flinders ranges that our inclusions are thought to have been a part of the Laird evaporite sequence might actually be significantly younger. So occasionally you'll see blocks of uh, limestone with like archaeocyathids in like the Weary Alpha diapir, for example. Um, but you know for sure, okay, it's obvious that it's, um, it's much younger than the salt because it has the archaeocyathids in it. When you start talking about the Neoproterozoic or the Ediacaran stratigraphy, it becomes significantly harder because you don't have those fossil assemblages to tell you, okay, you have bits and pieces of the much younger stratigraphy incorporated into the diapiric breccia and that are sitting perhaps next to, next to something that could be nearly a billion years old. So I hope I'm making sense and I hope you all follow that. So this is the geologic map of the Padawarta diapir. So this is a compilation of some research that I did for my master's. Um, Evie Ganaway would have done uh, the super cell basin for her master's and then I combined everything together and mapped the internal part of the diapir for my PhD. So everything in the, in the gray is what I did for my PhD. And this was actually, the area wasn't super large, but it's super difficult because there's like a ton of faulting, um, a ton of sheath folds and recumbent folds. It's structurally like the messiest thing I've ever seen and ever tried, attempted to map. So I think I have probably 80% of um, the answer, but I think there is definitely some like serious questions that maybe even some of the best mappers would struggle with in this area. But anyways, it doesn't really matter much. Um, I would like to take you guys now through the, um, the stratigraphy. So just comparing um, the Wanaka formation. So we're going to focus in on Wanaka and then the lowermost part of the Patsy Hill member, which is the upper or the lowest part of the Bonnie Sandstone, if you will. So it's been the stratigraphic nomenclature along that boundary has been um, defined, refined over the years. So depending on who, how old the literature is, it's gonna be called different things. But anyway, so we're gonna focus on um, the lower limestone towards the top and progressively get younger. You can see that these are all silty carbonates um, dominated by horizontal laminate. Um, they're mostly limestones. <clears throat> there are some dolomites, but they're at the very, very top of the section. So that's a key observation is that you have um, 
a lot of silts towards the bottom of the section, it becomes more limestone rich. And then towards the top, you see silts again with dolomites. So because we don't really have anything besides stromatolites, and there may be some algal laminae in the lower do dolomite beds, so the very lower part of the slide, those I think could be algal laminae. Um, that's really the only fossil that we have in these rocks. So you really have to keep in mind, okay, we're going from siltstones to limestones to more siltstones, uh, and then you see dolomite. These are some of the detailed observations based off of the outcrop and the petrography. Um, I'm not gonna go over this in any great detail, uh, but the main thing that you wanna take away from this is that um, I had the same observations that Peter Haynes did. So you, it seems like you're going through a shallowing upward sequence overall. Because I worked next to a diapir, it was sort of a hybrid system. So I often saw graded beds and things that reminded me of, oh, could that be like a turbidite? I don't think though that they are turbidites in like deep water turbidite sense in the classic sense. Um, I think that you're actually dealing with like a shelfful marine process. You have a diapir that's rising on the shelf and that topographic relief of the diapir is causing turbidic flow next to the diapir and that is generating graded beds and things that look like turbidites, if you will. So it's a very hybrid system. This is uh, just a generalized uh, depth of environment of those lithophases and of those stratigraphic observations. So I'm not gonna get too lost into the details, but when you're looking at the mini basins next to the dive here, you see an overall shallowing upward from maybe an offshore shelf environment going into perhaps the foreshore to coastal plain to maybe a look more of a lagoonal deposit. In the Patsy Hill member, you see these isolated lens bed of dolomites. And a lot of times um, those dolomites remind me of something that you would see in more of like a lagoonal type setting. The barrier bars that you see are actually set up um, by the diapirs themselves and the topographic relief created by the diapir. And that's nothing new. That was something that Wolfgang and uh, Peter Haynes and um, you all had recognized a long time ago. This is a compilation of the fence diagram. Uh, so this is from the subsalt on the right and the super salt on the left. I just wanted to show it to you so you can kind of see the bedding thicknesses. And the main reason I'm showing this to you and the reason why it's important is the next slide. So if um, you look at the stratigraphic thicknesses, so this is, as a stratigrapher, this is just something that I do like to compare thicknesses, if you will, because when you compare thicknesses, you can start to say something about the salt history. So it's really important um, if you're at all working in salt to measure the thickness right next to a diapir. And then as you go away from that diapir to keep you know, recording how thick it gets, because that's going to tell you how the salt moved through time. So you can see here that you have the super salt side and the sub salt side. So this is uh, nothing new. This is older research that we had completed. Um, you see those thicknesses and then um, you move over to the study that I did for my PhD. So this is some carbonates that I saw inside of the diapir that I think are probably Wanaka formation. You can see that um, how thick they are. So overall, like if you look at intersalt inclusions thickest section, so more towards the right side of the screen, you'll see that they're anywhere between 30, uh, 55, 70, and then you have one member, the green member that's 200. But overall it's um, somewhat aligned, but pretty condensed. The lower part is the of the Wanaka formation. So the blues are stratigraphically condensed because they're much thinner than say the green and the purple. So those are um, going into the Patsy Hill member of the Bonnie Sandstone. That's just something to keep in mind, an observation to keep in mind. Okay, so now going to Padawar to dive here. This is a study from um, the 1980s. So this was put out in 1984 by Hall. Um, I just adapted it. And there was interest in this Padawar to dive here because there is copper associated with the carbonate units. Um, those copper trends are actually in um, the, the blue lines that you see right there. It's 
you know, it's just north of Blinman. So they thought they saw similar age stratigraphy. They're like, oh, okay, well, maybe we see something there. I don't think there's a lot of copper there, but it is there. And I actually, I do have um, some fluid inclusion data and um, different types of other data for more of like mining implications. Um, I'm not presenting that here today, but it's really neat um, to see some of this work being used in more of a mining sense. Anyways, these are uh, the inclusions and the carbonate beds that are of interest. So when this was originally described in the 80s, um, Hall, he would have, or he did put them down as Kalana groups. So he would have called these really old um, carbonate beds that would have been a part of the Laird evaporite or sort of the autochthonous salt, if you will. Um, what the point I'm trying to make with this research is I think that they're actually the Wanaka formation. So hopefully I can uh, convince you with some of the outcrop data, probably not on the geochemistry, which I'm still working at, but um, definitely the outcrop data. This is what um, the things that I feel really confident are the old stratigraphy. So from the Tonian, um, this would be Kalana group. Um, these are mostly siliciclastics. Uh, you'll see halite casts superimposed on wave ripples and B. You see siltstones and shales. Um, and then you also see the volcanics. So you do see basalts that have um, vesicles and they flow parallel to the stratigraphy. So I think there are actually some, su some sub aerial volcanic flows. And then you also see some diorites. So some that have like mixed grain. So some really large phenocris and some really small phenocris. So you see different types of volcanics, which is also really cool. All right, so going back to the geologic map. So now I'm gonna focus in on those inclusions. So those carbonate beds that are in the gray. This is what it looks like on Google Earth. Um, so when I first started working in this area, it was like really heavily vegetated. The working in the dive here was super difficult, but by the time I got there for my PhD is when the drought was much more prevalent up there. So actually it sort of became easier, sadly, through time to do some of this work. But just so you know, um, this is Home Rule Flat and Padawarta Hill just sits over off to the right. So there's a radio tower up there. And this uh, alluvial fan that you see sort of in the center, modern alluvial fan, is referred to as home roll flat. You can access this from Narana Station um, off to the north and then also from Mululu down to the south. Um, it's basically hard to get to it either way. The road is passable with a four wheel drive, but I camped on home roll flat and it's a really great camping spot. They have like um, cute little cows and like feral cows and feral donkeys that run around in this area. So it's pretty cool. This is what um, the inclusions look like inside of the dive here that uh, I worked on. And you can see that to me at least, someone who's, I've been you know working on the Wanaka now for 12 years, and it's great. I'm so glad, Peter, you're here because um, he's worked on it really long to see what he thinks. To me, I could say that these could be Wanaka formation as well. So you can see what they look like in um, outcrop and then also in thin sections. So their pair, the, um, the labels match each other. You can see that um, overall, it's um, same sort of observations that you get uh, Silt rich, so this is uh, dolomite towards the top, you have your silt, and then you have your carbonates. I think you're going to notice, though, that overall there's um, a lot less silt in this system or in this part, except for D. It's a lot more silt rich. So you're kind of splitting hairs over how much silt are in these carbonates to see sort of the differences. So I, to me, they look really similar, um, nearly identical. Uh, from outcrop and then also under thin section. I can sort of make and match those members based off of the lithostratigraphy. These are some uh, just some additional data that I took. So I measured um, the length and the width of each of the inclusions. Um, the key thing though, and I'll just go back, is you really see um, sort of a gap in uh, sedimentary structures. And that's also important for um, the salt tectonic interpretation. Uh, so here in the middle, the intrasalt. salt, so those are the inclusions. I just have it written that there's horizontal to wavy laminae, but it's basically horizontal laminae. So the inclusions that are in the dye pier that, we th that I think are Wanaka, um, you don't actually ever see the 
the shallowing upward sequence. And from a salt tectonic perspective, that is, that's a good thing. Like if I saw the same thing, I would kind of be like, hmm, I don't know. I mean, I could make up a story, right? Like a geologic model of how I think it worked that way. But the fact that it doesn't have um, that shallowing upward sequence is actually, um, it works for the geologic model, which I'll get into after this slide. Uh, this is a zoomed up image of my map. So this area, I didn't even put in any of the faults because um, you see evaporite or diapyric breccia along potential fault boundaries. And it's really hard to tell the difference between what is uh, considered diapyric and what is actually a fault. So that's why I didn't put them in there, just because I felt like it was conjecture, like I would maybe be over-interpreting just because it's so complicated. Um, the dark green color, the forest green color, is the volcanics that are associated with it. Um, the copper trends are uh, mostly prevalent in inclusion two, where you see um, here, it just looks like some weird isoclinal recumbent fold, but um, much smaller outcrop scale. Number two is where you actually see those sheath folds. So if you're familiar with the sheath fold, it actually, it's like the shape of a banana. It's a three-dimensional fold, essentially. So you actually see uh, veins, the veins that cross cut that carbonate unit, the quartz and dolomite veins that contain the copper deposits, those veins are actually been folded into the sheath folds. So there's been some really complex uh, structural movement in these rocks uh, from the Delmarian orogeny. Okay, so now we're gonna um, sort of set you up for the fence diagram. So these are um, the stratigraphic thicknesses for each of the inclusions. Because of those folds, it made this, doing this measuring section through um, recumbent folds is not easy, um, very difficult actually, but we were able to get something. So these are um, pretty much probably as good as you can get. And then um, from there, we put it into the sequence stratigraphic interpretation. <clears throat> so before you start working on um, what we refer to as the halokinetic sequence stratigraphy and figuring out the salt tectonics, you really have to set up your depositional environment and do um, that work first. So you do your sedimentology, and then um, you figure out, okay, you have a shallowing upward sequence. Um, this work agrees with all the literature. Um, I think we're dealing probably with third order sequences. Um, I'm sure that's up for debate. I think a lot of what we see in the Flinders Ranges and in the Precambrian, um, the big regional surfaces are third order, not the, um, the younger or the smaller order, if you will. But um, basically what I think here is um, overall, not to get lost in the weeds, you're coming into a high stand systems track through the Wanaka. The Patsy Hill member is being deposited as a low stand systems. And then uh, you're going back into a transgressive. So you get a deepening and then an overall shallowing upward going up into the Ediacaran member of the Bonnie and then the Ronsley. But what's really neat about this is that um, because we see only silt grains and horizontal laminae in the inclusions inside the dive here. One could propose that this is actually a carapace. So it would have been like the roof sitting on top of a dive here. It wouldn't have necessarily experienced um, wave base, if you will. Therefore, you wouldn't have seen sedimentary structures. It would have just been sort of hanging out on top of the diap here. Probably um, could have even been subaerial, maybe at one time. Um, that would make sense from a salt tectonic perspective. So I'll get into that. Um, additionally, other sort of lines of evidence. So I'm just trying to weave together a story for you. Um, when you're looking at the dive here itself and you start unraveling the structural data, uh, we put out, our research group put out a paper in 2015 that uh, used the halo kinetic sequence. So this is a whole nother topic I really won't get into in this talk, but this is something that I had done for my master's um, where we did, uh, we looked at this fold sitting down here where this red arrow is off on the lower right hand side. And the 
you can basically use halo kinetic folds. So folds that were forming at the time that the sediments were being deposited next to the salt body, you can use those fold axes to tell you the direction in which salt was flowing at that exact period of time. So based off of that fold axis, we can conclude that the salt during that time would have been flowing down to the south. So the southern part of the dive here is flowing down to the south. When you look at um, the structural data in the northern part of the dive here, so the other arrow that's on this image, the Kalana, the big salt sequence forms a huge sheath fold. That sheath fold is nearly, um, the axis is nearly five kilometers in length. And based off of the data, um, put it into uh, stereo net analyses, the salt in the northern part of the dive here would have been flowing off to the north, northeast, if you will. So that actually helps us. One would expect that if this was just a plain dive here, like a regular vertical rising dive here, all the salt would have been rising in one direction, going basically what would have been up during that time. So the fact that we have a salt body that's moving in two different directions, that tells us something about the dynamics of the salt flow and the salt behavior. So one thing that I specialize in is combining these really basic structural uh, observations with the, the sedimentology and the stratigraphy. Because basically in order to come up and put back together the pieces of what this salt or any salt dive here would have looked like, you have to use data and information from sort of two disciplines. And that's what makes some of this research, some people may think it's a little esoteric, others may think it's, um, it can be really powerful. Um, when we work in the oil industry and look at this stuff in there, people find that it's actually pretty powerful and useful and it helps them understand um, the, the prospect that they're working. So what we see at this scale in the Flinders is very helpful to what you see at the seismic scale in the Gulf of Mexico. And when your wells are really expensive and you're working in the offshore, it's important to know what you're looking at before you go drilling it. So now I'm gonna put all together all the pieces of the puzzle. So this is a, a schematic cartoon. This is not really map view, but kind of, it's kind of a cross between a cross section and map view. And because the folding is complicated in the Flinders, um, it's just sort of the best thing I could do that hopefully was simple enough to make sense. So what I think happened and what we're looking at is you have your subsalt mini basin down to the south. So the right hand side, you have your super salt mini basin up to the north. So that's sitting on top of your alloxin salt body. This whole guy, it's not a regular dive here, so a vertically rising dive here. It's actually a lochthinus. So it would have been vertical down here where you see these double dots that we refer to as a weld. And that's basically salt would have been there. That's sort of the neck of the dive here. Uh, we see this now as a fault, but the reason why it's a weld or why we would call it a weld is there would have been diapiric matrix there originally, and then because of the Delmere neurogeny, it would have all been squished out. So you basically have brachina on top of brachina. And then um, when you're looking at the gray part, so that's the salt body, the inclusions that I worked on. So the Wanaka formation that I think is carapace, those silty limestones, um, they would have formed what is referred to as a suture zone. So if you can think in your mind, you would have had this salt body, one salt body sitting off to the right. So below that suture zone, that would have been one salt dive here. And then you would have had another one that would have came up over here off to the left. Um, that would have rose up and flowed and because, or yeah, flowed is probably not really a word, but anyways, so those two would have came together during the Delmiri neurogeny. And effectively what you would have had is a suture zone forming. In uh, salt tectonic terms, we refer to this as an aloe suture. So if you remember to the beginning of the talk where I showed a picture, it was in the post salt section of the Gulf of Mexico Tim Dooley was the reference and he had all those reflections inside a gigantic salt body. That is effectively what I think Padawarta is. And what you're seeing is a very condensed zone of the Wanaka carbonates down here where you see the really thick part. So if you remember to the chart that I told you that had the really thick um, pink and green units, that would have been like a little tiny mini basin sitting over here. And then there's also another piece of the carapace. 
Another thing that's really interesting, and this is totally conjecture, but all those bits and pieces of the inclusions are broken up. So I think it's totally reasonable that at one time you could have perhaps had a recumbent fold and then also boudinage. So there's really complicated um, things that can happen. I did do some physical modeling to try to sort that out, but the results weren't really clear, unfortunately. So we didn't really end up publishing it. We just basically tried to model this in the lab. We were able to come up with something similar to this where you get stretching in one part and then compression in the other part. But um, yeah, it was just sort of more of an experiment more than anything. Okay, so now to go on to more of the, ge uh, the controversial geochemical part of this talk. So this is where, um, yeah, if you guys have any ideas or discussion, it would be really great to hear your thoughts. All right, so we're gonna go um, to the Precambrian for carbon uh, isotope curve. So within um, the Precambrian, there are uh, five excursions, if you will. Um, they're in the Flinders ranges. The only one that we don't see to my knowledge and to the literature that I found is the Islay. So the region, there's a regional unconformity at the Kalana Burra contact, and that isn't deposited. I believe that additionally, the Bitter Springs has not been located. It would probably be in the Willowern Ranges if it was, but I know that they see it in the Amadeus Basin um, up near Alice Springs. So um, that's well documented up there. And then I know some of you um, are probably really familiar with like the Trizona. So I'll be focusing in on the Sherum. And those of you that are familiar with the Sherum know that it's um, famous because um, it exhibits in certain locations um, negative carbon isotope signature as low as 12, negative 12 per mil. Um, if you look into the literature, now this is something that I find interesting. So depending on like what group you talk to, some people think that, you know, oh, it could be the Sherm excursion could represent any four of these things. So I just pulled this from Husson's paper that he, he did a big regional study. It's from Princeton. Um, he put out this paper in 2015. Uh, he talks about these four things. And it's funny because like, depending on who you talk to, some people, so I'm not a geochemist by any means. I don't necessarily claim to be one, but I do like to use other types of methods to help um, figure things out basically. Um, so it's funny because like I spoke to someone a few weeks ago and they were basically like, you, you realize that the Sherm excursion has been proven to be exclusively burial diagenesis. And I mean, clearly they have a vested interest in, you know, their papers and promoting their research. So, I mean, I get that, but at the same time, it's funny because some people, you know, that's what they say. It's like, oh, there's no question, but I don't, I don't know. I don't really see how you could ever, what exactly, what sort of geochemical methods you could use precisely to tell you the difference between these four things. And maybe there are some people here that feel really comfortable and can speak on that better than me, but I'm not the expert. But anyways, I just had some observations, mostly. Okay, so this is the very preliminary study, but if you look at the data from this region or from this area, Starting down with the diapiric matrix. So if you look at the breccia itself um, in the gray, it's in BR3, that has um, somewhat of a scattered, but definitely more on the positive side, if you will. So it's kind of hovering more around zero. So we see this in the carbon and the oxygen. The oxygen isotopes are really confusing, so I'm not even gonna go there. But basically you see very similar signatures between the matrix and then what um, another paper that I have is called, um, it's lateral caprock rim dolomite. So there's a semi um, famous like anomalous carbonate unit at Padawarta that's referred to as the rim dolomite. Um, I did some geochemical work and I real detailed like micro drilling the different isotopic facies and stuff. But anyways, all of that kind of hovers around zero plus or minus, um, you know, three, four per mil. If you start looking at the mini basin stratigraphy, 
um, you go from hovering right around zero and then you see the spike down off to the left. So you go negative. And um, the regional data I have is in the black line. So Husson's data is in the black line. My data is in everything else. And you can see that the inclusions, so I, and I didn't do a huge sample. Um, I was hoping to go back and sample more um, when I moved there, but because of COVID haven't been able to continue this work. But anyways, um, you can see here that this preliminary study just showed uh, some of these as being, they're negative, but they kind of, and this is the red stars that I'm referring to, they're kind of starting to hover and look more similar to what you see for the diapiric matrix and the rim dolomite. So it's not really conclusive. It's totally inconclusive. You can't say, you know, okay, yeah, no question in my mind. This is another plot of those um, geochemical results. So where the Sherm excursion is in the basin, in the mini basins, um, I have highlighted in the gray. So they're not as negative. I think that um, if I would have sampled more, which is, this is my first time really doing this type of work, I, if I would go back, I would definitely sample like way more. And I think I could have maybe gotten, captured that negative 12, but anyways, I did have one that was kind of approaching on negative 10. If you look at the inclusions, the inclusions this time are in um, the blue diamonds that are enlarged. You can kind of see a trend and you can see that one of the inclusions fell within sort of the Sherm excursion realm. And then all the other inclusions fell somewhere between um, the diapiric matrix, which is concentrated over to the right, and then the Sherm excursion to the left. So these are kind of falling in between. So it's basically every shade of gray, not clear at all. So one thing that I'm semi-proposing, um, not stamping in and like putting my name on it or anything, but um, I think that these are actually, um, they've been obviously diagenetically altered. Um, and one thing that someone said to me is, you know, okay, so if the Sherm excursion, the person that said that I'm absolutely sold on, you know, the Sherm excursion is um, absolutely a diagenetic process. Okay, sounds good. Um, you know, their issue with this story or sort of the argument I'm trying to make here is that, you know, how can you diagenetically alter something that's already diagenetically altered? But with that being said, anyone who has studied really old rocks, really old carbonate rocks from the Precambrian, I don't think that they would think that that was the craziest idea on the planet. So basically, um, what I think the best technique uh, to solve this going forward and something I hope to continue in the future is using CL, so cathodoluminescence, so illuminating the iron and the magnesium in the carbonates, and then uh, going in and sampling each of the different colors. So each sort of pattern of different colors represents a different phase. I've not done this yet for these, but I did it for the cap rock. And you actually see a trend of um, certain colors, if you will. So the bright oranges have a certain isotopic variation versus um, the background or the dolomite matrix, if you will, that has um, a different signature. So more of the brown color. So if you can go in there and perhaps sample each of those different phases, maybe one of those is the Sherm and you can say, okay, this actually has that negative 12, the dark brown, for example, maybe, and that's more, that's more iron rich is the dark brown, iron and magnesium. So more on the dolomite spectrum, if you will. So if you can go in there and say, okay, these all come back as a certain um, alteration. And then you have all these other ones that are much uh, lighter, more yellowy, much more uh, carbonate rich or limestone rich, if you will. And those are actually more towards um, the positive spectrum of things that uh, maybe you can start to build your story. And then maybe in a way, this may not even necessarily, or it may sort of disprove, well, is the Sherm truly diagenetic alteration? So anyways, I just have a lot of ideas. Um, happy to talk more about it. Um, definitely like it's so not conclusive at all, um, just acknowledging that. But I feel confident that with the said strat and the photography and looking at these rocks for a very long time, knowing them really, really well, um, that using that alone is enough, I feel to, to say that these 
are likely Wanaka Formation rocks. Okay, so just to wrap things up, because I know we're starting to run out on time, um, just to go over my observations. So um, I'm not gonna beat this to death or anything, but these are some of the things that I saw. So we saw the shore face, the overall shallowing up in the mini basins. We saw um, very uh, specific horizontal laminae of those carbonates in um, the diapir and um, therefore leading me to believe that those rocks inside of the diapir were deposited as a roof or a carapace on top of the salt. And um, the mini basins on either side actually went through and saw the entire uh, shore face sequence, if you will. So in conclusion, we would have seen um, Padawarta diapir would be two diapirs that would have coalesced together during the Delmirian orogeny. So it would have post-dated um, the Wanaka formation or the age of the, the suture zone, the blue that's kind of running through the gray. And then it's really common in the Gulf of Mexico. And when you hit these suture zones, when you're drilling them, if you don't see them on seismic and you hit them, you actually, um, that's when you lose your well and you start to have all these drilling problems. And it's due to fluid flow along that plane or that surface, that bedding plane. So because of the nature of the carbonates and um, the silt grains that are in those carbonates, you would have started diagenesis early and quickly. And basically fluid would have preferentially chosen to flow during in those carbonates rather than like the halite or um, sort of whatever the dolomitic matrix is made out of it would have preferentially um, chosen to flow through those carbonates. And that idea or model very much coincides with what we see when we drill through these things, um, looking for oil, if you will. So that's exactly what um, the well logs tell you from a drilling perspective. Okay, um, I'm not gonna go over this because this is basically just what I said. So, um, uh, sincere thank you to um, everyone who has sponsored me over the years. It's been a really great group of people. Um, and then also just a plug for this thing that I'm running. So right now um, I've been working on developing the salt community and um, really trying to diversify it in terms of uh, people and topics and locations. So there's some places that we know a lot about salt tectonics in the world. And then there's other places that we know very little about. Additionally, you sort of have these sort of key research groups that are scattered throughout the globe. And a lot of times within those research groups, things sort of get recycled. And it's really good to start from purely like a research perspective to kind of start cross pollinating ideas within those research groups. So I've worked within two of those groups already, uh, both in the US. So the, the consortium that I came from and then also um, the Applied Geodynamics Laboratory at UT Austin. So they're really seismic heavy. The group that I was with was really outcrop heavy and they fundamentally look at things differently. Um, I studied more things like sub seismic and they studied real big, broad, um, more regional observations. So it's really good for people to start seeing more of what other people are doing and to like cross pollinate and talk to each other and to have things be a little bit more open and free form. So if you ever, um, and I know some of you are really interested and you have studied salt. So if you ever want to be a part of this, um, our meeting time is not ideal for you. Um, I have to do it at seven o'clock in the morning in the US and I think it's like nine o'clock at night in Adelaide or something like that. I know Bob Delgarno, he's actually called in a couple times. It's really great. I love when he's able to, he stays up late, has some coffee and dessert and watches it. But um, we have people, you can see one of um, this, the presentations that we have, we literally have people calling in from all over the world. I think we have like 63 countries on there dominated by the UK, Mexico and um, the US. But anyways, it's been really great. If um, you're not into learning about salt at nine o'clock at night, which I hope you aren't, <laughs> um, you can always catch the recordings on the YouTube. 
So we record everything and then I post it on our YouTube channel. So it's always there for you. You can find us on, um, we're most responsive on social media. So we love doing that. Um, as I'm sure you guys have seen how we get on Twitter, um, Facebook, LinkedIn, and then please feel free to email us. The email is a group email. So we prefer that if you have questions about this, you just email the group so we can all see it because we like to share everything and stuff like that. So anyways, that is all that I have from you.